Good evening, witches, warlocks, sorcerers, adepts, friends, fans, family, and followers to the newest episode of Knights of the Nephilim podcast brought to you by my company, Celestial Oddities Radio. As always, I will be your guide on this mystic and mysterious journey that we call magic. I'm Reverend Freighter Crow of the International Church of Lucifer, and I thank you for listening in tonight. Whether listening live, streaming after the fact, or you've downloaded it to your favorite device for on the go, I appreciate it. But make sure that you click the like, share, and follow button on whatever platform you're listening to us from, from iTunes to iHeartRadio, Spotify, Deezer, Spreaker, CastBox, Amazon, or Google Play. We air across absolutely everywhere, so listen where you feel comfortable. But by clicking those buttons, what that does moves us up the podcast community rankings, allows more people to discover the show keeps you in track with new episodes as they air and gives you unfiltered access to past episodes and uh, we give you something for absolutely everyone that's a fan of the occult we do air every other thursday night from 8 to 9 30 p.m eastern standard time bringing you interviews and talk show portions with the best and biggest names in occultism and mysticism and tonight certainly will be no different we'll dive into a little bit about our guests this evening here in just a moment I do, uh, you know, ask that if you have anything that you would like to ask our guests or be involved in the show, if you go to Spreaker.com or the Spreaker app, and that is S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, that is our hosting company. They have an instant messenger feature that will allow you to not only listen to the show, also allows you to be a part of the show, partake in it, and ask our guests questions. And we always certainly like to, you know, see that. So feel free to jump in and be a part of the show. And also, if you have any suggestions of what you would like to see us do on the show, not do on the show, anything in between, don't hesitate. You can drop us a line at Knights of the Nephilim podcast on Facebook. You can drop a line on Freighter, Freighter Crow's Facebook, which is my own personal Facebook. And you can also drop us an email at celestialoddities at gmail.com. And then once again, that's celestialoddities at gmail.com. We are on episode five this evening of season two. I'm very excited to you know, bring you another season of this great show talking about the things that we love, which is ritual, research, you know, theories, a lot of great things in the magical world. And we've had some great ep- you know, episodes so far this season, some great guests. If you missed our last episode with Shaki Dewan of Sufic Sorcery, we talked a lot about things that you don't often hear of the mechanics of ritual. We talked about missing pieces of the Goetia and the Lesser Keys of Solomon, where they have removed most of the elements talking of the jinn and turned them into more of Chthonic beings. Um, and you don't hear much of the jinn spirits anymore, the fire spirits. Um, then we talked about a lot of other wonderful topics. Topic. So if you missed out on that, please jump back. It's a great episode, and uh, we were happy to be able to bring you that. Tonight, let's go ahead and jump into a little bit about our guests, and then we'll go ahead and get things started. So this one's one I've been very excited for, guys. Um, you may or may not have heard of these guests, and then I say guests, there are two. It is a husband and wife combination here that are very, very powerful in their workings. I am a very large fan of their work, and when I came across them, I'm going to give you kind of a quick side story, and then we'll go ahead and tell you about them. I was doing personal workings with Belial, and it's it's ironic that that is the case because these two work heavily with him, and and, and I you know have in the past, but I got to be honest with you, other than working him as one of the four cardinal daemons that I use in my satanic practices. I hadn't worked with him too much over the years, but I decided it was time to start working with him. Now, as I started working with him, I asked him, you know, can you show me what is next for me? What is to come in my path that I should start paying attention to and focus on? What is the direction that I should head in? Now, within that same evening... Barbatos from the Goetia's name came up several times in things I was reading. For some reason, I was thinking his name. There was just an instant pull to working with him, and I wasn't sure why because I was trying to work with Belial. So a couple days later, it might have been about a half a week, I did a summoning of Barbatos. And when I did, I asked him the same thing. I was told to go in your direction. I was pulled towards you. Can you tell me what is the next step in my occult journey? I'm ready for a new path, ready to take on new obstacles. Had a very in-depth connection, very powerful ritual. 
Now, when I finished this, folks, I decided to kind of ground myself afterwards and to relax, and I sat down at my computer and listened to a little bit of music. Now, this is like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I usually do ritual from about 12 to 3 a.m. usually. And so, weirdly enough, I had a playlist going on on YouTube of different metal bands that I liked listening to, and after the one song, it just cut right to this video of Baron and Baronessa Aragni from Ar- Arcane Serv- Aragni Arcane Services. And what's weird about it is, when I look back over the playlist, their video wasn't on the playlist, but it should have played in order down through the playlist. It was someone else's created playlist, but it had nothing to do with occultism, had nothing to do with these two. But for some reason, after this video, it just kicked in straight to a video of these two talking about necromancy, which is a very near and dear subject to me. So obviously I paid attention and I watched their video and then another video and then all of their videos. There was this instant pull to them. There was this instant pull to their website. The same night, I bought 11 of their books, um, which is not something I normally just pull the trigger on, you know, instantly diving in like that, especially a lot, 11 books from someone. I bought their entire catalog at the time because I knew there was a reason that I was being drawn this way from two different spirits in the last two weeks. Picked up their books and started reading it, and they were the glue that pieced together so many different things that I had already known or been thinking that I've never got confirmation on that... I just needed to hear myself from someone else saying it. It was phenomenal within the first month of buying these books, the amount of gaps that were filled in. So let me tell you a little bit about these two, and we'll go ahead and jump into what will be one hell of an interview tonight, guys. I'm going to read it from their perspective. We are a husband and wife team, the founders of Aragni Arcane Services. We have over 33 years of occult experience, which we have perfected through years of successful practice. We have created Aragni Arcane Services to help those who cannot help themselves using the occult arts. We are adept in all fields of our practice. We have mastered black witchcraft and necromancy, amongst many others. All our workings are based on ancient traditions, and it has proven itself to us and our clients throughout the years. We offer our services to all those who seek it, and we do not discriminate against race, gender, or sexual preference. We take a no-nonsense approach on the occult, for we believe that there are many who are deceived by mundane practices. All our divinatory works are highly accurate and detailed. All of our spellcasting services have been perfected throughout all of the years of successful practice and is extremely powerful. All our products are handmade of the highest quality material and empowered through ancient rites. If you wish to know more about us or our business, or if you require our services, please contact us or visit our website. Ladies and gentlemen, grab your ceremonial cloaks and daggers, your magical grimoires and pens, light the candles, and step into the circle as we begin to summon Baron and Baronessa Aragni. <laughs> Alright guys, we are here tonight with Baron and Baronessa Aragni. Thank you guys so much for taking time to speak with me this evening. Yes, greetings in the name of Azrael Rex Mortis and thank you for having us. Absolutely. 
it was a pleasure to have you guys on. As I said, I mean, the way that it came about and how everything just kind of worked was very strange and instantly knew that there was a pull to your work. It's very powerful, very different, which I think obviously you guys have mentioned in your videos that you have no desire to be like a lot of the practitioners in the modern world. Let's face it, a lot of the shit that's out there these days is absolutely dumpster juice. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's sad to see what has happened from ancient practices to what's happening nowadays. I feel that it all has its place in its own right, um, but there are certainly very powerful ancient workings, and then there are adapted, watered-down, new-edge versions of things. And when I came across your guys' work, I, I said to myself, well, this this is raw, this is real, this is ancient, and this is, this is powerful. Um, and every single thing that I've read from you guys has been on point. Well, thank you. And, you know, regarding modern occultism, you know what? That's actually why we think that we are so unknown, we suppose, because we don't really deal in, well, the modern practices. Yeah, all, everything we practice is basically very visceral, especially with necromancy. It has to be visual because, yeah, it's life and death. Well, I think, you know, <laughs> well, the problem is, is, and like I said, it all has its place, but the problem is, is that today it's very clicky. It's very social media driven where it's like, you know, who knows who, the same 50, 60 occultists know each other and you know the fans out there all know these 50 60 occultists and it becomes a very clicky group of friends which is nothing wrong with that in one sense but the problem with that is is if you only stick to those same people you're only hearing those same workings and mindsets and there's so much more out there and most of the gems that you find are the ones that you've never heard of and the reason that that is and, and I only speak of myself here is as they've always said through ancient tomes and manuscripts is Shh, you shouldn't speak of most things now that doesn't mean you can't write books and release workings but you are not advertising yourself in that light you have power and you let those that are right to find it find it yeah and you know something that that's actually something not the, the keep quiet and all that part but something that really kind of against us we aren't part of that clique per se we are loud people on social media or, or anything like that. Actually, you've even seen with our videos that after a while we stopped making them because we're not really people people, <laughs> if we can put it like that. Yeah. Well, no, it makes sense. I mean, you stick to your work and you stick to what you guys know and you don't really worry about the bullshit behind that. You don't worry about being popular or likes or shares or any of that. You figure, at least I'm, you know, I'm thinking you guys do. You figure that you put out your workings, it's powerful, and those that have a mind to know it are going to know it, and those that don't, well, then that's okay. But, you know, there are going to be people that find your work and say, wow, this is nothing like anything I've ever seen before. And I've read a lot, thousands of books at this point. I've, you know, been through a lot of different grimoires and workings, and your guys' work and I, I speak only for myself, stands out tremendously to me of being powerful and to be legit. I mean, it's easy to write a fascinating story and, and tell. I could write a book right now that is like a Stephen King occult manuscript and people would love it. But does that make it powerful? Does that make it true? Absolutely not. It just makes for a great book. And that's okay, I guess, in some ways. But the problem is, is so many people want to follow that as its absolute truth. But where is its bearings? Where is its roots that it came from? If it came strictly from the experience of only that practitioner with no basis beyond that, I mean, the only way it's going to become true is if enough people believe in it, then you start to make thought forms and, and other beings that maybe will make things happen. But it's not powerful, connected information that you gain from the beings themselves. And when I read your guys' work, work I, I know that I'm like, wow, these guys have definitely channeled this information. And you know what, <laughs> that's the funny thing about us. Since day one that we decided, well, you know, we're going to go public with our workings. We're going to go international with us, with our books and everything. We realized from day one that with our stance on practices and how sort of different it is from the mainstream things, either you're going to love our things, our books, whatever we do, either you're going to love it or you're going to hate us, but absolutely despise the living shit out of us. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, we we what who we see ourselves as is we're not really authors. We are more occultists than we are authors. 
and we don't um, tend to rehash things. We we um, pr- practically apply things, and that's how we dare to bring forth that material in our written books. And it shows. I mean, it shows that first and foremost, you guys are occultists who write, not writers who practice the occult. Um, and I think that that is what most people are fooled by in the modern sense is that most people are – following and loving the works of authors who on the side do do magic and and, and are practitioners but first and foremost they're authors their point is to simply make a good book and you guys aren't trying to weave a story you're you're just cut dry here is powerful workings here is what we've discovered through our workings here's what you can do to make it work and be warned it's real and it is very powerful you must beware and i mean i love the fact that you know other people have put you know warnings in their books and you mentioned this in one of your videos we're not trying to be like everybody else and say be careful with this book it could kill you no this book actually could kill you and i mean and when you read your books you you feel that like you feel wow if i don't do this operation properly if I don't put enough vested time into this to to honor these deities and this work properly, something could happen to me very badly because it is real workings. The sigils to the tables that you guys use to, you know, just the description of how the connection with the ritual works is phenomenal. It's very deep and heartfelt, and you can tell that you guys experienced this. Practicality, practicality always. You know, you can find theory in many places. And yeah, even in some of our books and stuff, we do share the sufficient amount of theory to, you know, get the message across properly to make people understand. But we're not theoretical people. We we cannot stand theory only. Theory is useless if you cannot practically apply that which you've learned. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, theory is theory is great, but if if yeah, if you have no way of actually applying it, then really, what is it at the end of the day? It serves no purpose. Um, and, and I can tell you from doing the rituals and workings from your guys' book that I've done so far, I still have a long, long way to go. I mean, between the eleven books that I bought, that's you know six lifetimes worth of work. Honestly, you could you could take any one of the books and make that your working for the rest of your life. And that's what I love about it is one single book could be your entire lifespan of practice. So I look at the the 11 that I have and I'm like, you know what, I got to pick and choose what I want to try, what I want to work, but do it with honor um, as there is multiple lives worth of work here. So if, if I do come back, which I'm hoping I don't have to, but if I come back again, hopefully I can find your guys' works again and continue where I left off. Well, uh, likely our work will probably take off once our vessels are dead, <laughs> as <Yeah>. it goes. <laughs> usually it usually seems that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to summon us, though. Yeah, I won't try to summon you guys <laughs> if and when you guys are gone, if you guys leave before me. I'll leave you alone. But uh, why don't we actually talk about that a little bit? Because obviously I know one of the things that I think my fans are very excited to hear about tonight and we'll kind of lead up to that is your guys' phenomenal work in necromancy. So before we jump specifically into that, though, how did the two of you get started, both individually and as a couple? I mean, what started out your first experiences with either A, the occult, or just spirits in general, and either one of you can start out on that, but what is the first moment that you had that that life-shattering, like, whoa, there's something way beyond just us? Okay, well, I guess I'll start with this one. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, speaking I, with this first part i believe i can speak for the both of us when i say that you know we our experiences didn't start out because uh we it's a let's just call it a haunted house situation or we've had some paranormal experience or anything like that actually no um i myself i was raised semi-strict christian you know you know how that goes most people know how that goes And after a while, when I was very young, you know, I started asking questions, but not, you know, to my mother or my father or whoever. I asked, you know, the Sunday school teacher, and then that gets directed to the priest because what is this child asking? These questions are heretical, (laughs) you know. And Then I started to realize, even from a young age, you know what, there's far more to life and, well, just this, and even this, the doctrine which is being taught as this religious belief, is not complete, it is incomplete, and these people do not fully even understand what their own belief system means or symbolizes. And I can say that my 
uh, driving force for pursuing the occult and magic was knowledge. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but also knowledge for the sake of power. Because this world of the physical, you know, that's just a very tiny, tiny little drop in the vastness of an eternity and honestly people are so absorbed into you know mundane life but yeah you can understand that because you know you're alive so obviously you're going to care about life but i'm interested in what lies beyond this life yeah and also what you can gain from this life you know in your practices and as anyone who i suppose would come from my background and you don't really know about things, you know, and you mess around on the internet trying to find your path, per se. I became a spiritual Satanist, and but you know, not knocking anything, but I just became a spiritual Satanist, not to be opposing what I've been taught. No, 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 nothing like that. It's because I thought that equals magic, plain and simple, and that's what I wanted. I wanted the knowledge. I wanted magic i wanted to practice it not just practice it i wanted to master it and yeah ironically that's also part of how we actually met each other um and yeah so i started with uh, special satanism you know just trying to find my footing by myself without a teacher which is an absolute nightmare because then you're probably nothing more than a glorified dabbler i guess then i actually met my dearest husband, through me trying to find a teacher or anyone that can teach me anything, and from there on, he properly initiated me into black witchcraft, which I will now give over onto him because that's sort of where, you know, a lot of synchronicity between us. No, that's awesome. Okay, this is my turn. Um, <laughs> I started ooh, many years ago um, while I was... In my very early teens, I had an interest in, you should say, the occult, the unknown, the unseen world. And then, um, seemingly coincidentally, I met my teacher, Morigiana, and she uh, initiated me into black witchcraft. Uh, before that, she was part of the Gardenian witch covens, but she disagreed with a lot of the how can I say, traditions, etc., and so forth. And um, she was a high priest, priestess, so she started her own movement. And professionally, she was a midwife. And, uh, yeah, I, I studied under her, and she taught me everything that she knew in regards to black witchcraft. And uh, then uh, I met my loving wife. And yes, I initiated her and taught her as well, everything. And together we just ascended. We, um, together we studied higher magic, ceremonial higher magic, theurgy, and eventually we came across our order, the Ordu Atras. And by that time we were already knowledgeable, adept at necromancy itself. Now, Ordu Atras is, um, consists basically of black witchcraft, and necromancy tea in Africa. So we were initiated under them. Later on, we became teachers there as well. And, yeah. And no, I'm not going to spin you a beautiful love story here. No, 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 it's not about that. When we met each other, he was already vastly more experienced than I was. He's being very modest when he says huh. black witchcraft only. No, 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 no. He was already far, far more expensive at that point in time. But when we met each other, we experienced what we like to call the quickening. It's it's something so profound, it's so difficult to describe that if you as a listener experience this, you will know it for a fact. It's like when we met each other, it's boom, there there we go. It's then there was nothing stopping us anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting you say that because I was going to ask that. I was actually going to bring up that, you know, when you guys met, not to, to be like your typical love story, you know, that you complete me, you know, and whatnot. But but truly, when you guys met, was it almost like not only spiritually and lovingly, but, you know, ritually something had clicked then. You knew that you found the other part that you guys were missing because I, I think it's safe to say from from what I see, the connectivity between the two of you and the symmetry that you guys really do complete each other as partners and as practitioners. Um, you guys are so seamless with one another. It's great. 
Yeah, it was like, um, if we can describe it's like time stood still and it like all the dimensions, spiritual dimensions at the same time opened up and we were these two figures amongst all the shades and the dead and all the denizens of the infernal realms and we were amongst the flames and the ether and the darkness and there we were making love in that instant in time which seems like an eternity. Just to you know, illustrate it, because most people actually, when they come across us, in this relationship we have with each other, sometimes she confuses them. I'm losing you a slight little bit. Uh, sorry, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. It's probably just a con- internet connectivity problem here. Sorry. That's okay. All right, so um, with us, that's people of us confuses people sometimes actually because they don't really understand this dynamic that we have and it's more than just a dynamic it's to give you a little bit of a picture about that when we met each other within probably two weeks of that we were married oh wow let's put it like that (laughs) yeah that's awesome though i mean you guys (laughs) knew that um you know that it was meant to be and like you said it was more than just a a carnal connection. It was more than just a partner connection. It was, it was, as you said, realities in, in different dimensions kind of shifted to make this happen for, for reasons maybe at that time you didn't fully understand. And I'm sure, you know, have certainly learned more over time, but still might not fully understand as the chapters are still unfolding. But I mean, if you look at the work that the two of you have created together, it's phenomenal. And I can't help but feel that that was a part of the reason that, you know, the ancient gods wanted you to, be able to release this info. They wanted to be able to have you channel them and tell you secrets that um, this world needed to hear. Because as I said, when you read a lot of these modern books, there are hidden gems in some of them. But the problem is, is it, it's like a pig digging through shit for the pearls. You know, it's it's you're, it's not easy to find. Um, and, and there's a lot of, like I said, good filler. There's a lot of stuff that you read that is entertaining. And that's fine. I like to be entertained. But also, when I'm doing research to actually do ritual and to continue the further advancement of my practice, I want to read no filler. I want to read real content. Um, And that's where it becomes hard. So for anybody listening out there, I, I ask you to please check their website out and certainly pick up a book of theirs and read it because I think instantly, you know, before you even finish the book, I think when you're the first, you know, quarter of the way through the book, you're going to sit back and say, holy shit, um, this is something different. Um, This is not like anything I've read before, and I feel it. I mean, literally the energy jumps off the pages, and doing some of their necromantic operations, I have had the wildest things happen, and and I got to tell you, um, I think you will too if you follow them step by step. Uh, so if you're looking for something like I was, um, and, and it just really solidified itself for me whenever spirits directly contacted or connected me with these two, um, I had personally at that time never had heard of them. But this is something that I have been deep diving for a while now into their work and am so honored to have them on the show tonight. And I know if you guys read it, you will certainly feel that too. So why don't we jump into that? Obviously, you guys made the connection. You guys got married. You guys, you know, you know, Baron taught you, Baronessa, everything that you had known at that time, you know, for the most part, and you guys grew strongly together and rapidly. What made you decide at that point, we want to go public with teaching and helping the greater masses to start writing and to really launch your own practice? Actually, that in, let's just call it the grand timeline of our history, our life story, uh, that was actually, that's a more recent thing, actually, because locally, yeah, we would help out locals. Yeah, we did that. And at first we did it, you know, freely. As most bright-eyed people start off with, you help people out of the kindness of your heart, you know. But you spend a lot of time around humanity and then that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed sensation dissipates pretty quickly. And then we completely for the longest time and then we decided you know what well actually we're just going to be totally honest about this we uh, as mentioned before we're not really people people we are not really social people we're she refuses if, if 
and we have to be very honest about that. So we were at a, a bit of a, let's just call it a downturn part of our lives. Yeah, just normal, mundane nonsense and all that. And we're like, no way, screw this. In part, fueled also by new books that was being made available by people about the occult and about magical practices. And we were reading it, we were digesting it as we do to this day. And we were, we just got angry, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yes. So then we were like, no, you know what? Fuck this. Okay, just we're just going to go. We're going to start making a name for ourselves. We started going on forums and stuff, which is even to this day it's a very foreign concept to us. And then we went to a place we had a shit off business and then we started writing because people were interested in getting books from us, seeing what we have to say about things. So And which was your and what was your very first book? Oh, that was um, Bird Tennis and Bernard. I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. What was that? Lebe, Infernos, and Bernard. I was going to say, I have it in front of me, and I thought that that was, but I didn't want to say it was your first book and be wrong. Um, <laughs> I actually, that is one of the ones I haven't finished yet, so it's weird. I, I jumped right in like a, like a kid in a candy store. As um, soon as I bought your guys' catalog from you, I, the very first book um, that I jumped into was um, Necromancy, The Black Door. And uh. and then I jumped in afterwards to the Gospel of the Ghouls. Um, and, and then I kind of worked from there to the Hexagrammaton, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, then I jumped into your guys' adaptation and workings with the Goetia as the Howling Spirits, which I found fascinating that in that book, and I don't want to say anything that you know could ruin it for other readers, but... The way that the two of you described what the spirits of the Goetia, the 72 infernal names actually are, and your thoughts on it, really kind of, it, it, you know, it, it was something that I, I thought before myself, and I'm like, wow, these two just literally had the balls to say that in a book because no one ever has that I've read. Um, and, and then the meditations that you say of how to work with, it doesn't make working with them any less amazing, but it puts it into a different, clearer lens of how you believe these spirits and what you believe these spirits are. Um, and then the, the meditations at the beginning, um, was profound with walking through the woods and walking down the hill to the cavern and, and walking, you know, around the, the, you know, the, the, the only way I can describe it would be like a a well of water almost, as you guys put. And, you know, when you're deep in, in ritual and you do these meditations, some wild and fascinating things had happened for that. And then obviously the necromantic rites as well. And I've been actually slowly over time crafting multiple tools from your guys' books, but doing it properly that I'm not rushing it. I'm letting it come to me. So there are certain pieces and bones and things that over time I'm letting kind of work itself out um, to create these magnificent necromantic tools. So thank you guys on those workings. But yeah, I haven't got through all 11 yet. Um, my problem is my focus I will work on these books, but then there's another book that will pop up that has something I need to read in. And sometimes I'll read eight books at one time, which is kind of weird. Most people think that's strange. Um, and then I kind of go back and forth. I have a massive library here of more books than I could ever physically read in my lifetime. Um, but I have gotten through, I think, about seven or eight of the 11 so far. Um, so it's been a wild journey, and everything I've come across so far I think is absolutely phenomenal. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, we, we're always glad to get such excellent feedback from our books. Um, we're even in contact with a whole bunch of people that got our books, and they actually keep on updating us on their progress as they're working through it. And everyone that actually applies what we write in any of our books, they all have such life-changing or practice-changing experiences. And, you know, what? we're just happy about that, even if we can just reach one person say, with something in one of our books that helps them on their path or clarifies something or opens a new door for them, you know, that's what we want. It's the one person who doesn't care about the, let's just say, thousands upon thousands of masses. No, it's that one person, and that's enough for us. 
Well, yeah. and what, we also, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And we also offer um, support, you know. And if someone wants us to clarify something or put in upon something within the books, you know, they can always contact us at any given time. They can, because I've even myself reached out and said, hey, I have some questions and want to make sure that I'm doing this ritual right, because the last thing I want to do in something this serious is make a, make a clumsy mistake on it. And I've reached out to you guys you know, a couple of times, and you've been very um, quick on your responses back, been very detailed and very kind on that. So people, that's a rarity to not only have very powerful work of this caliber, but to be able to reach out to the two of them and be able to get clarification on it so that you do your ritual properly that is you know something that you don't get often um, and if you do get it often usually like I said it's from practitioners that you know a lot of times feeding you bullshit so um, to get someone who's actually legit is, is a nice thing and I can tell you from the workings that I've done personally not only is it strengthened my workings which I've been doing a very long time it strengthened my workings with um, infernal rites and with conjuring of spirits but one thing I've noticed which I'm very thankful for, is I have been a paranormal investigator for, I don't know, roughly since I was, you know, 15 years old. So it's been a very long time, and I've always had really amazing, phenomenal experiences. But I've noticed that since I started working the gospel of the goals and and taking it serious and making the tools and performing these rites, that not only do I have wild experiences in my temple and altar, but in general, Um, When I go out on my investigations to heavily charged places, I'm having things that are way beyond anybody else that's there, whether it's members of my team, whether it's an open public investigation and there's a few randoms that I've never met before. You're meeting up hours into it and people are saying, did you catch anything? Did anything happen? Um, And a lot of people, oh, I had a couple little small things happen. What about you? I'm like, I had the building absolutely going, you know, ape shit for me. And then they're like, well, what do you mean? And I start showing them film of, of lights, you know, in different rooms flashing on and off, multiple EVPs of, of spirits talking to me, just a lot of stuff that I don't publicly release. And that's the weird thing. It throws a lot of people off. Why don't you release it? I'm not, I'm not a ghost hunter. I don't release it to get popularity. I do these things specifically and only to contact and connect with spirits. Yes, sometimes it's fun to share, but most of it as my rituals, I keep to myself. I'm big on, on honor in that way. But I've noticed working your guys's um you know rites of necromancy that my interactions even when i'm not doing ritual with the dead have been just phenomenal well you know that is that is excellent to hear and you know we're, we're just going to be honest the gospel of the ghouls as a, by itself that is what people actually know us for ironically for our necromantic yeah. practices so we practice, but that because even us oh, feedback we get from that is excellent. And you know what? For everyone to keep in mind that writing a book like that on necromancy is yeah, yeah. It's, it's not that easy as you might um, think it would be. I mean, um, we've only released the pre-orders of the Gospel of Ghouls Volume Two recently, and it took a couple of years for us to finish that book. Itself. We've been in to write on and we we should you not at the romance. That's something completely different. Yeah, it has its own feel to it. I mean, when you're working with necromancy, the I mean, for anybody who hasn't done it or you know not done real necromancy, the feeling and energy and vibe and atmospheric change is something hard for a lot of people to to be able to adapt to and understand. For instance, I have done some rites from this book in which, and and Murmur has always been a spirit that I've worked with pretty heavily even prior to your guys' workings, but I decided to amplify it up a little bit and and work with Murmur in a different sense um, with these practices. Now, I can tell you, the wildest thing happened. I had summoned him during a very involved ritual, and the atmosphere of my temple changed to something that I had never felt before in my life. I felt, I felt somewhat like this before, but the only way I can describe it is truly feeling death. And, and, you know, obviously I've talked with spirits and had these experiences, but no, my, my temple permeated with the feeling 
of what it would be like to be the spirit of the dead. And obviously I've had interaction with him, but this was different. I was sick to my stomach, felt violently ill almost, but I pushed through it and said, no, I will not let this stop me and pushed further into it. And the gnosis and information that I got from him afterwards, when I was pushing myself past that limit, that threshold that 99% of practitioners would back off on and say, I have to back out now, hit the ejection button. No, I wasn't hitting it. I was going balls to the wall. I was either going to make it or it was going to kill me. And I broke through it. And when you broke through it, folks, there's no way of describing it until you do it that's when, like I said, my shit has been off the fucking chain lately. I mean, I've been I've been going to locations and just the wildest things happening without me asking, let alone my necromantic rites since then and even my demonic rites. Um, the connectivity and visualization and gnosis that I've been getting has been just something that I have been practicing for many, many years, and you know I've always had success, but I felt like I broke through a barrier that launched me from zero to 100 in seconds rather than years. You know what? Actually, we're going to use this opportunity um, to actually make a warning statement type of thing for anyone who wants to practice necromancy, if they're thinking about it, or anything of the such that you might recall that we have written in the Gospel of the Ghouls that if they're, you know, that we're not really, we don't encourage people to worship those things that they work with, whatever they may be. But we did mention that if there is one thing in all of existence that is worth being worshipped, it's death itself, Rex Mortis, Azrael, whatever name you want to refer to it as, that's anything that's worth worshipping, per se, but... To never, ever, ever, ever do that because we've literally had people saying, oh, you know, I followed your instructions and now I am a worshiper of this. You know, what these people cannot read. <laughs> we literally, I can actually hand over to my husband here to actually, one of our experiences back then, just before we started writing the Gospel of the Ghouls, about how we perceive Azra or at least death itself but in the guise of Azra. Um yeah. I think that I about death himself and or itself. Death is not really he it's uh, we refer to death as he more out of convenience and um yeah, okay, death appeared as the faces of every single person in existence, who ever lived anywhere at any given point in time, and those images flashed like in a split second. It was so overwhelming that um, it raped my senses, looked quite literally. And there's two very prominent images which I saw in regards to that as well a book and a sickle that went with that. So you can only imagine that, you know, that was just, it, it does sound a bit, a little bit risky if you think about it. Oh, we want to speak to death itself, but, you know, that's just how we are. And yeah. that's, it, it was just absolutely mind-blowing. And to this day, that just that by itself and all the information we've gotten from from death, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it also shows that death doesn't really have, death itself doesn't even have a form or a shape, but it represents all things living which has passed. I think I might have lost you guys again for a split second. Sorry, can you hear us now? Yes, I can. I heard the, I heard the last part of what you guys said, but then you faded out right at the very end there. Okay, so back to the point then. Um, we even asked about the various names and let's just call it geysers as it is known by in different cultures. And we brought up a certain name, which we'll just call it the Canaanite version of this. We don't want to speak the name because out of just out of respect, if we have to be honest. And that name immediately had a reaction, if we can call it death frowned, <laughs> because that particular facet of death itself was worshipped, not because he requested it, but because humans gazed upon the concept of death itself and they just fell down to their knees. And death despises worship, just, you know, as an FYI out there to everyone. 
Yeah, and it's and it's very <laughs> extremely powerful. Like I said, I mean, whenever I felt it, as you said, you can use different psychopomps to be able to connect with this current of ultimate, you know, power. I mean, death is permeates everything, and there's one thing for certain that any physical vessel or flesh being of any sort will perish. No, it doesn't mean that our soul will die, but our physical vessel certainly will. So that is something that is is inescapable. It's a very powerful and ancient force. It's been around since, you know, the beginning of time, obviously. And I felt like during the grand necromancy rite, um, that is what I experienced it. Now, I experienced it through the help and guide of Murmur, but what I experienced when that current swept into the room was not murmur. I've I've worked with him numerous times. He ushered in death. And like I said, when it hit the room, the entire atmosphere changed. The feeling I was feeling changed. I felt like I instantly melted, um, you know, which I felt in different ways, but never like this. Um, I almost couldn't breathe at that point. It pulled the air out of my lungs, and I just instantly locked into mental vision and connection with death. And this was during the rite of of making the liquid libation offering um, and, and mm. you know, drinking from it, which it talks about in the book, and that's all I'll say. It was phenomenal. I used my Kapala um, and, and drank from it to make it even more resonant. Um, and... It was phenomenal. Um, like I said, ever since then, nothing's ever been the same. Um, and I'm glad. I'm certainly looking forward to even furthering those workings. But um, that's why I said, folks, if you're listening out there, this isn't your average run-of-the-mill bullshit that you see in the cult these days. This is workings that unless you are a real occultist, you should not attempt because a lot of people like playing Dungeons & Dragons right now. It's fun, guys. LARPing, I'm sure, is great. Wearing your costumes and talking on the internet about all these demons that you summon that you've never actually summoned, it's cute. The problem with it is, is once you actually have certain things show up, things become real very quick, and they don't take kindly to you bullshitting everyone about the workings that you didn't do that you proclaimed to do. These are the workings here, guys, that if you do and it works properly, and you should hope it does because if you do it wrong, you're really in trouble. If you do it properly, unless you're ready for it, this is going to fold you like a lawn chair. You're not going to be able to handle it mentally, physically, spiritually. This is for people who want to make this more than a weekend warrior thing, more than just a hobby that they do from time to time. This is for the elite. Um, and you have heard my episodes, folks. You have heard me talk uh, to numerous amazing practitioners. You've never heard me give this warning. This is the realness. This is legit. And this is dark. And it is powerful. So if you're going to attempt it, I ask, you know, that's great. Please do. They deserve the respect and, and the, you know, the support from all of you. But if you are listening out there and even for a slight second doubt yourself or your workings, don't do it. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys a real quick side note. And I talked about this on one of my episodes and maybe you guys heard it. I wanted to be stingy with you two and keep you to myself. Um, <laughs> and, and it sounds, it sounds really fucked up, but it's true. In fact, my one friend's listening in this evening and she told me that I couldn't be, she says, you must share these two with the world. Um, and, and when I say that is when I found your guys' working and started reading your books and started experimenting with your rituals and the profound experiences I was having, I didn't want, I mean, it literally, it made me not want to share it with anybody when normally I would want to share it with everybody because I'm big on helping people grow. But I started to say, this is the best shit that I've ever come across, you know, in a modern sense. And I don't want anybody else discovering it. I wanted to be stingy with it. Um, and, and it took a little bit of talking from a good friend to just say, no, they need to hear about this, Freighter. You know, let them know about this. And I wised up and said, no, you're right. I just wanted to be selfish. Um, and that's why certainly I reached out to you guys a little bit after that and said, hey, I want to bring you guys on because I want the world to hear yeah. about it. And I think people deserve it. But seriously, that's how profound your guys' work was to me personally, that I just wanted to keep you in. Well, thank you so very much for yeah, that. thank you. <laughs> much appreciated. We wanted it. Thank you. Now, I have some people coming. I have a question here. Someone said, Goal, uh, you know, the Goals 2 is coming soon. Is that correct? And I believe I just seen a post on it the other day. Has it dropped yet or is it about to drop? It's about to drop. Um, we're letting the pre-orders run until the 10th because we're, you know, trying to give people some time to, you know, 
figure things out and stuff. And then after the tens, then it's going to drop. Okay. Perfect. I'll definitely be picking it up. Thing is, I'm like, can I, am I even ready for, you know, the goals too? Am I, am I ready to take this on? I mean, I'm still so invested into the first one and I'm like, I feel like I'm light years away. That's why I said, I mean, even just sections of the book you could spend, a, you know, years on. You don't even need to go through the whole book. You can literally work some of the operations um, and, and work a half of the book for the next five years is the way I feel that because some of the rituals themselves over and over again are just so profound. Um, some of the some of the numeric uh, keys that you guys gave, um, I've had some very good success with. I really liked, you know, working on the tools too. I'm not a big crafty guy when making like my own stuff. I don't normally do it, but making the trivia avatar, or making, um, you know, the specific necromantic dagger and sickle. I found a lot of fun in that, not only power, but fun. And I'm not normally an artsy guy. Most of the time, I, I hire out for people to make me tools um, that are good at what they do because I enjoy that I'm not artistic. But this, I knew it meant so much to me that I couldn't hire anybody. I had to be the one to make these tools. And that's awesome. You know, um, in those two books, um, Gospel of the Ghouls, Volume 1 and 2, basically – which we decided to share with, with people in our practices and stuff. If you follow everything to the last letter, we guarantee you that you can actually pull any spirit from any realm at any sphere right into your microcosm without the need of an altar, without the need of any tool or evocation or invocation. Which is going to be discussed in volume two, of course. Yes. That's awesome. If you, no. adhere, to, awesome. If you adhere to the teachings in, in those books, then you'll be able to do it. Money back guarantee. You hear that, guys. Now they just sold me on the second one. I was already going to buy it. Now I'm sitting here like, damn it, another book that I got to try to fit in and read and work, which is phenomenal. It's a problem that's great to have. But no, that's phenomenal. Um, you know, I can't wait to certainly see what you guys have to say on that topic. Not only did I make, you know, tools from the book itself, but I actually hired out a gentleman who's very good at making um, a lot of different ritual items. And I had, and I think I, I sent to you guys, um, I'm having an evocation um, summoning board made with specifically, you know, the necromantic keys on it. I have Azrael's sigil and name around the triangle of manifestation, along with other great things that I have added to it. Um, it inspired me to make a specific board for summoning that I will use the black scrying mirror in just to try to get closer to some of these spirits mentioned in this book. Um, and I can't wait till that comes in. It was a long process. I haven't making me three boards. So I'm kind of, you know, selfish in that regard. I haven't making me all kinds of stuff, but, um, you know, once they come in, I can't wait to try that sense out and mix that into the workings as well. Um, because I know that it's going to be pretty powerful. So thank you obviously for that. I mean, anything that you can share out there to someone that is thinking about breaking that, taboo into necromancy a lot of people want to summon demons a lot of people want to work with angels a lot of people want to use energy manipulations and all these things that are so common practice these days especially since the resurgence of all these grimoires and especially the lesser keys of solomon it's like everybody in the world talks about it um but most people that you talk to in the modern scene when i bring up necromancy they're like oh no i don't i don't fuck with that um, and it's funny because that was always one of my passions and something I was always into, but it, I felt like I was like a lot of these folks that, you know, I practiced necromancy at a very light level. I mean, it was like, you know, comparing lesser magic to high ceremonial magic. I mean, both are powerful in their own right, but it's a big difference. Um, I was always performing lesser magic and then I found your guys' stuff and I'm like, okay, now I step up to the big boys. Um, you know, so what would you say to someone wanting to breach into this field? Um, basically, sure. Um, forget everything you think you know, and uh, contact death itself first and foremost, and then he or death itself will initiate you into that current and that path. So, if you're nervous about delving into necromancy, yes, it is an extremely dangerous field that you shouldn't just screw around with. Definitely. We always warn about that. But life and death is like 
unified. It's it's two faces of the same coin, basically. Life goes hand in hand with death. There's no, no practice that is more naturally attuned to you as a living person than necromancy. Yeah, and it's also the uh, oldest practice known to mankind in regards to spirituality or the occult. Also, necromancy is a complete paradigm in of itself. So, necromancy, you can do your, you know, lesser magic. You can do your sympathetic magic. You can do whatever you want there, and it's it's just uh, when you practice necromancy, losing you again a little bit right now. Sorry, uh, are we back? Yes, you're right there. There you go. All right, necromancy is rolled into itself. You don't need any other paradigm if you choose to make necromancy your paradigm of choice you'll be set you won't have need for anything else yeah you have a whole whole family a whole new spiritual family there to back you against anything that life and the spiritual world can throw against you so yeah well you heard it folks you know absolutely powerful stuff and very very true um, you know, like I said, if you are brave enough to try this arena and field, and I don't say try it, I mean, you, you got to be wanting to do this. This isn't something you jump into, try for a week and then jump out. I mean, be heartfelt with it. You know, certainly pick up the Gospel of the Goals 1 and 2, um, you know, amongst their other works, but those are two of my favorites. Um, well, the first one is, I haven't read the second one yet, but I already know it will be. Um, so before we jump into further talks, I want to talk about the Hexagrammaton here in a moment because I know that that, you know, at the time was certainly your magnum opus and that was your big phenomenal work that kind of shaped your practice, you know, in a lot of different ways. So we're going to speak of that. But before we do, folks, stick around. We're going to jump into a quick message here for our sponsors. We'll be right back after this. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Goetic Impressions. Goetic Impressions is a company dedicated to the faithful creation of advanced ritual tools by following grimoire guidelines as closely and as feasibly as they can in the modern world. Follow them on Instagram, Facebook, or their website, GoeticImpressions.com, to stay informed on new projects and limited-time items that they roll out frequently. For listeners of Knights of the Nephilim podcast, you can use the promo code KOTN10 for 10% off of your overall order. Again, that is KOTN10 for 10% off of your overall order. And make sure you check out their Facebook, Instagram, and website. Once again, the website is www goeticimpressions.com again that is goeticimpressions.com for absolutely everything for your ritual needs fantastic items quality items greatly priced quick shipping can't speak highly enough about these guys absolutely wonderful team and i'm glad to have partnered with them thanks guys knights of the nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor limitless liberation i'll read you about this wonderful company from their owner elena Limitless Liberation was inspired by both Lucifer and Belial. Lucifer has been with me most of my life, as far back as I could remember. Belial and I started to work when I was going through a very difficult part of my life. He completely turned mine and my family's life around, for the better, in a very short period of time. In return, he asked me to create what he called Charger for him. He showed me the designs, so I created the first Charger for Belial, and Lucifer wanted one next. From there I had spirits lining up with requests for magical items. Some are control freaks, while others just inspire. They are all so individually different, but every single item created has power within it. Each item operates on many levels. They operate as an anchor for the spirit you're working with, thus aiding easier connection between the two of you. They also operate like a power cell or battery, where they already come with an inherent energy to them, but they become stronger as you feed them and pull from them during ritual, as well as to strengthen your workings. Limitless Liberation continues to grow to honor the spirits that we love to work and build relationships with. You can check her shop out at etsy.com backslash shop backslash Limitless Liberation. Again, that is etsy.com backslash shop backslash Limitless Liberation. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, the Telemancer. Let me first tell you a little bit about their owner, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about them. James Hunter Ralston has been a member of the Order of the Voltec, starting in 2008 and progressing through several degrees, last serving as head of the Outer Order. 
The Order of the Voltec is an offshoot of a pylon of the Temple of Set, originated to study and practice several forms of the sorceress methods centering on techniques used by Mexican and other Central American priests and magicians. Many of the techniques involved were popularized in the late 1970s and 80s by Carlos Castaneda. Over the decades since his first experience with magic, his desire has grown into the creation and use of what other shamanic sorcerers term as power objects, talismans, amulets, totems, and other powerful objects. His interests expanded to the degree that he chose to become an apprentice of several Appalachia's premier craftspeople and learn the art of metalcraft to produce power objects for both himself and select patrons. He does work with gold, pewter, silver, and sometimes other metals as well. He has been doing this for over eight years. He does create talismans, pendants, rings, altarpieces, and more, almost all exclusively by custom commission. And you can check out his stunning work at facebook.com backslash the telemancer one. Again, that is facebook.com backslash the telemancer one. All as one word. Thank you so much. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Belladonna's Botanicals. Belladonna's Botanicals is owned by Jennifer Vatza, a left-hand path and poison path witch, certified aromatherapist, herbalist, perfumer, skin care formulator, and incense crafter who designs and created a massive product line consisting of over 300 products with new ones being released every month. Belladonna Botanicals provides high-quality handcrafted metaphysical and self-care products including flying ointments and oils, herbal tinctures and elixirs, herbal smoke blends, ritual oils, powders, incense, radionically charged crystals, ritual bath products, fragrances, and bath and body products. Jennifer draws inspiration from the spirits she works with and they often have requests. Anecdotally, adding that as she was creating her product lines for the Dark Goddess and Demonic Gatekeepers, that King Paimon showed up requesting his own product line as well. She often directly channels what they would like to be included in their products in addition to her own ritual workings along with known correspondences. She also has a popular left-hand path-oriented YouTube channel where she posts content on everything from podcasts with other occultists, her gnosis from working with different spirits, and various topics pertaining to her crafts and creations. Her website is belladonnabotanicals.com, and you can check her out on YouTube by searching her name Jennifer Vatza, and that's V-A-T-Z-A. So again, please check out belladonnabotanicals.com or her on YouTube by searching her name Jennifer Vatza. Check out her products, absolutely phenomenal blends, mixes, tinctures, and elixirs, great flying ointments and everything in between. Thanks, Jen. We appreciate it. All right, guys, we are back. We took a short break to give some spotlights to our sponsors. I once again want to thank Limitless Liberation, Goetic Impressions, The Telemancer, and Belladonna's Botanicals for everything that they do, from candles to amulets to rings and pentacles to flying ointments and everything in between, all fascinating stuff to use in ritual. Um, you know, I have bought and used every one of these guys is workings. In fact, I'm doing an unboxing video coming up for each of my sponsors um, to see what it is that they sent me as a mystery box and also what my initial thoughts are on the thing sent. And then I'll be doing a follow-up down the road of what I thought of their individual items. Now, I've already worked with these companies, but sometimes they surprise me with wild things. I got some new flying ointments that were sent to me. Um, I got some new uh, uh, Enochian crystal ball sent to me of the uh, Sigil de Meth uh, on there, which I look forward to trying to do on some scrying with um, some John D work. So should be very interesting coming up. Um, and I thank these guys for what they've sent. Um, I don't want to spoil it out there that you just heard some of the things that I got, but still doesn't uh, really ruin anything. So make sure you watch the videos as they drop. Phenomenal products. I stand by these guys with everything I have. 
If you've been listening for the last hour, um, you have heard us talking to Baron and Baronessa Aragni of Aragni Arcane Services, two wonderful practitioners coming to us tonight from South Africa. So I did want to make the mention that if the, the phone line is cutting out a little bit here and there, it is the fact that they are across the planet from us for most listeners tonight. Um, and it is hard there with service on internet, as they've already mentioned, sometimes it's a little spotty, but for the most part, it's, it's done very well. So we're thankful. If you are loon- just tuning in now don't fret you can always go after the show and listen back to the entire episode right now you're stuck listening for the next half an hour live but you can go back download it to your device or stream it and hear the entire episode and this is a wonderful one folks that you guys don't want to miss we talked heavily for the last hour about their you know starting how they got into the practice how they started teaching and becoming the people that they are today and the practitioners as well as their deep workings on necromancy which certainly to me and as they said to many others has been the one thing that really makes them stand out though that is only one small piece of the big puzzle that is these guys' practice next I would like to talk about the hexagrammaton so can you share with people in a basic sense because obviously they should pick up the book and read it can you share with the listeners out there what the hexagrammaton practice is how this kind of came about for you and really what it's meant to your practice yeah, um, okay, the hexagrammaton came about as we started asking questions. Where is magic? Where does magic originate from? And then we um, obviously dug in very deeply and came to the conclusion that it comes from the self, the individual, from the soul itself, which acts like a massive battery of sorts and that which we put within the self, in the soul, in other words, will be projected outwards in the microcosm and macrocosm. And, yeah. Also, um, the information of, well, our experience throughout the years is because no matter what paradigm you go into, and by the way, apart from our occult and magic paradigms that we delved into, we also even went through religious practices, <laughs> which is very strange, actually, hearing me say that out loud, but we did because... We look for the truth, the truth above all else. And after a while, when you, you know, look at everything deeply, you start noticing a lot of common factors and and, an alchemy, a, a gnosis, a codex. It's all very Gnostic. And that is what the hexagrammaton is. It just ties everything together and it's power to the self you know you it's nice to work with entities and spirits it's it's nice you know it, it has its place but to never neglect the self above all else because after all when your vessel dies and it is just you now they're not going to be you you are you so yeah okay, so at the end of the day you have to spiritually empower yourself so the book is about spiritual ascension in essence and that's what I love is you have books on spiritual summoning, you have books on necromancy, you have books on planetary magic, all these amazing things that you can do with ritual and ceremony. And then you have the Hexagrammaton, which is a book of spiritual alchemy. It is a book of touching that inner fire that is you. And I loved that. And there was a, there was a chapter of the book um, that when I read it you know, a little while back, just blew my mind. Um, you had said, and I had mentioned this earlier, there's things that you guys had done where it just filled in the gaps or it felt like I was reading my own words but from someone else's tongue. And there was a chunk of this book that when I read it, I, I was just floored because a lot of the beliefs that I had, I didn't hear a lot of other people talking about, I thought were lost to history, that a lot of people just were missing the point of spiritual alchemy and true inner power, because most people focus on the external. They focus on the spiritual summoning. They spo- they focus on rites and rituals, which is phenomenal, and it's it's perfect to do. But the problem is they never focus on themselves. So yes, they cause external changes, but internally they're a wreck. The proper way I've always felt to deal with it is to internally ascend, to eternally strengthen yourself beyond measure and then focus on the external because by doing so, your external work will be stronger than it ever would have and you now have the proper vessel to handle this both internally and externally. And I read a chunk of this book that 
like I said, just filled in gaps on things and was like my own words that I'm like, oh my God, these guys get me and they obviously get it. And and, and as I continued to read, it just was profound. Um, to be honest with you, out of the works I've read, I love the Necromantic Rites because it, it's something that was always near and dear to me. But my favorite work that I have read so far is, in fact, that book. Um, it is pivotal, folks. It's something that if you are struggling in life and you have not mastered yourself, stop focusing on mastering external stimuli and things out there. Work on yourself first because by doing that, you will master the other. Um, it's, the, it's the bridge that most don't travel. They always focus on outside instead of in. This will help you focus on the in, and it will be revolutionary for you. Exactly, because the problem is, and we can even speak out of personal experience in, in our early practices, you think of everything that you want to accomplish and achieve, and then you think to yourself, well, how can I possibly do this for myself, by myself, without any external assistance to do this? And that's actually a very, very terrible pitfall. And it's almost like a trap. It's a death trap, actually, what people fall into. You have the power. You just have to develop yourself. You just have to grow. And then you'd be absolutely astounded but by what change you can create, what you can cause just by yourself. It's change your perception. Everything else will follow suit. It is. It's a magnet. I mean, you attract to you what it is that you project out and you attract to you your mindset. And most people just don't understand that. They they go around all day of their life, um, you know, every day, woe is me, my life isn't great. And, you know, I perform ritual to try to change it and it just doesn't change. Well, that's because it can't change if you don't change. They're not going to just come and hand you the magical keys to the kingdom whenever you summon spirits or you do certain types of workings it doesn't work like that because if you don't put in the legwork to change yourself all you're doing is doing all this external shit to never actually change anything um, sure you might have supernatural experiences you might have paranormal experiences but what is that worth if it doesn't actually change anything and that's where people get lost up in the glitz and glamour I seen this or this activity happen. That is great, but people get lost in that. It's not about having poltergeist or paranormal activity happening. Those are extensions of doing certain types of works. That has nothing to do with actually changing you. And it's weird because we as practitioners oftentimes get into magic to perfect ourselves. But we skip the biggest piece of what is needed to perfect ourselves. So I always found that fascinating. It's something that certainly modern practitioners in the modern occult skips by. There's not a lot of workings of inner alchemy. There's mainly external. And that's one of the reasons that I find a lot of this uh, modern you know, occultism and books and, and workings coming out to be you know, trash in a way because... Let's tell you a million different ways that you can divert your attention instead of diverting it to what it needs to be. Let's let's constantly have you focusing on the outer rather than the in. And that's that's a shame because if you don't focus on the in, you might have wonderful things happen in this life. And when you die, you're just coming back here again. And you're going to have to do it again and again until you can reach that level that you do ascend. And when you ascend, as you talk about in this book, and I'll say nothing further... Everything you've ever wanted is there. You have full range. Um, and if you would just spend the time getting that, you never have to worry about the ritual and, and anything external because you'll have it all. But so many people just get diverted in their attention. And unfortunately, as you said, it's the perfect downfall. I think it's a natural role created by the original source, um, you know, whatever that might be, to divert us. I think that is a natural law that we will always have people – focusing on all these ways to perfect themselves instead of what actually perfects themselves. Exactly. And, you know, what we always say, special ascension is a terrible and it's it, it will absolutely tear you apart. The self that you think is self, it will absolutely throw your life upside down. But that is for the better because what will emerge from the other side is and we do not say this lightly, but is godly and divine by itself. 
And I like that you said that because as practitioners who do very, very heavy and dark workings, I like the fact that you just said you can connect with what is divine because I've noticed this weird thing all of a sudden that using the word divine has like become a taboo for all these ooky spooky practitioners out there that think they're black magic practitioners. You know, oh, the divine. We don't work with the divine. And I'm like, I, and I'm like, I, I don't understand what you mean. That's the point. And they're like, no, the divine is our enemy. And I'm like, N- no, you're an idiot. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, the whole point is to find divinity. Divinity doesn't have to be Yahweh. Divinity doesn't have to be, you know, these different things that you've been told it is. But divinity nonetheless exists, and that is the end goal for anyone. And if anyone says different, it just proves to me that they really have no idea what they're talking about. Exactly. That's why as well with, let's just say, the hexagrammaton. When people read all of our other works and then they read the hexagrammaton, they're like, what the fuck is this? Oh, these are the same people because they don't really sound the same. I loved that, though, because that was actually what really caught me is I already read these darker works of yours and I loved it. And it was like speaking my 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 language, you know, and and then I came across that and read that. And that was really the staple. That was when it was not only, okay, these guys are good at ritual and, and, and necromancy and practices that I love, but when I read that book, I'm like, holy shit, these guys are, you know, they're it. That that was the working of yours that was the nail in the coffin, so to speak, of, of a lifelong journey that will be, you know, me working your guys' books and rituals because most people don't get that. I, I would, you know, go as far as saying 90% of the people I talk to, and I talk to a lot both in ritual and conventions when I do um, speaking and different things that I do, I'm involved in a lot, that talk about spirituality but completely blatantly miss the point of it. Um, it is very rare for me to find someone who actually understands it. And when I read that, not only was it understood, it was to a profound level. And like I said, there's just one section of the book that it just changed everything for me. As I read it, I'm like, wow, mic drop. You know, I was like on my front porch and I actually set set it down, had to walk away from it. And that's how you know it's good. When you read something that shakes you so much that you have to set the book down and you have to like walk away for a little bit and then come back and pick it back up because you really want to read it. But at the same time, your mind's so blown that you have to let it recoup. That happened to me. Yeah, divinity in essence is what you want it to be. Um, like we said earlier on, it's, just, it's, a, it's basically a matter of perception. And um, here's a tip for all your listeners as well. Um, spirits, it doesn't matter of the caliber, principality, or power. They respect power and authority above anything else. And how are you going to obtain um, power and authority? By empowering yourself through spiritual ascension. Otherwise, the only reason why they might listen to you is because of those of constraints. Of perhaps looting spirit or psychopomps to call upon. Otherwise, if you do not work on yourself and your own spiritual power, they're going to look at you and like, who the fuck is this person? Why, yeah. why should I give a shit about this? Exactly. You know? Well, that's a, that's a very that's a very important, powerful um, piece right there because I've confused a lot of people when I said the following thing. I tell them that there's levels to this. And I think people understand it at a base level, but they don't. I say, So many people get 10% of the experience that they could get, but they get lost in that 10% because even that 10% can be profound. And and that's all you're looking for, then hey, that's great and that's for you. I'm more of a 100%er type guy. I want the full thing. I don't want the wine cooler. I want the straight, you know, you know, moonshine. I want I want the power behind it. And and a lot of people don't understand that. And I say, okay. You've summoned different spirits. Let's use, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, Belial or Belial. I say you summon him. You work with him. You've had profound experiences. But what you've experienced of the spirit, if you've in fact even experienced the spirit, is a very watered down version of what the full connection can be if and when you actually connect to this spirit. You're having a very mundane experience, and if you were to move beyond that and do things a little bit more properly and dig deeper in yourself and in your workings, it would change everything. And 
some people have listened and had more profound experiences afterwards once I helped them a little bit. Some people still said, you know, I mean, I, I have great experiences. I don't need to listen to that. But the problem is I can tell by the experiences that they're telling me that they've not fully connected. They've not fully channeled. They've not – they've only had this drop in the bucket rather than the bucket itself. Um, can you speak to that? I mean what are your thoughts on that of the different stages of spiritual connection? And I think that will help lead us or segue us right into one of your books, which I have sitting six inches from me. I actually just, as I said, that picked it up, and that is The Black Book of Bel El Hall. Um, can you speak of deeper connection? Because as you know and have said, there's a lot of people that talk about working with him that don't actually work with him, or at least not in his full essence, and then kind of segue that into this book, if you don't mind. Well, we will say that when working with anything, say you summon something up, you evoke something, well, no matter what it is, no matter from which source power is power, regardless of its source, as we say, and you, you're like, okay, like you said, you know, you've you've had a good enough experience or whatever that is. You will know it's profound when it it. It's such a feeling that is, yet again, one of those very difficult to describe ones where, like you say, you, you just have to let your entire being just recuperate from this. It absolutely blows your mind and it consumes you, but not in a bad way, in, in a way that it further empowers you. I mean, when we, when we spoke to Belial um, so many times, um, we, we knew there was more to him than, than what met the eye. And um, we just took the time, you know, and just got to know him for who he was. And uh, he revealed so much to us. I mean, Belial was one of the godheads under which I was initiated into black witchcraft since the beginning. And um, Baronessa as well, when I initiated her as well. So I walked, uh, we both walked a long road with him in that regards. Yeah. Losing you a little bit there. I'm sorry. Go back. Go back a few seconds. Oh, okay. I'm um, better now. Yeah. Okay. Great. The thing about him working with him, you will know if you properly working with him. It he will change you entirely. But it's very easy to get lost in that part because it's very easy to become consumed in him and it's in his well entirety per se but with him we have this very interesting relationship with him he is still yes indeed the only external entity that we still work with on a personal level but that does not mean that we are let's just say super close buddy buddy with him it's his nature is the one of defiance of power of without a master and that actually reflects in our relationship with him which it, it's it's a very strong, unbreakable relationship. But even so, then it's that whole defiance and without a master thing that goes very strongly with him and which you do not just become as if, you know, it's a banner you're waving around, that it becomes you. Yes, if you if you um, ask him to help you with spiritual transmutation, then he will literally take the weak parts within your being and he'll change that, twist that, and tear that apart. And he will mold it like clay, and then he will build up your essence until it becomes something far greater and far more powerful than you can possibly imagine. We do not say this lightly. That's no. out of personal experience. Oh, no, I, I agree oh, with you 100%. The workings that I have done with him have been honestly out of of many of the spirits i've worked with he has a completely different and i mean there's reasons why and you guys even speak of that in your books but i'll leave that for the reader to find for themselves um different feeling different energies and as you said don't take it lightly folks if you do work with him and truly work with him because what happens is he will take those weak spots and he will catapult you like a car crash going 80 into a brick wall i mean you you gotta be ready for it and embrace it and even if you are you're probably not ready for it um and things will change at a rapid pace i mean he's not a slow mover some spirits it's a six month seven month process of small things to happen here and there it's gradual change what I've personally experienced working with him is that 
he makes it happen. He makes it happen hard. He makes it happen fast. And it doesn't matter if you're ready for it or not because you will either falter or you will triumph. And he's doing it to help you triumph. But if you falter, then that's good because you weren't strong enough to reach his lessons anyway. Um, and he is without a master. And I think with that same thing being said, you know, he should be given reverence and respect, but at the same time, you shouldn't make him your master because that's exactly what he is. He is without a master. Um, and that's only my personal experiences and, and my reality, but what I have worked and it's not near as, as in depth as you guys. Um, it has been, it has been wild to say the least. Like I said, I mean, instantly just asking him what my new path was a week later, I found you guys. And like I said, that has been, and I said it before and I'll say it again, and it's not to beat a dead horse, folks. You've never heard me say this on any of my guests. This is one of the most excited and anticipated episodes that I have done and probably ever will do. Um, and, and that is out of just absolute respect for these two. Um, if, if so, you know, if you ever work with Belial, be ready to be punched in the face with a brick um, in a great way. Um, you know, and just be ready for it. That's all I can say. It's just like necromancy. I mean, you have to be ready for it. You can't just willy nilly jump into it. As I said before, you have to know that you are ready. And once you do, he will give you the keys of what you're looking for, but you have to work towards it yourself. Belial or Belial, the he prefers Belial at least. Uh, but anyway, a bit off, off, off there. Anyway, he will transform you in such a way that she makes you run outside, scream to the heavens and the hells and all the realms in between. Why the fuck are you doing this to me? Exactly. Yes. 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 <laughs> And that is exactly the experience. Yeah, I mean, you will literally be like, what did I ask for? And, you know, wow. Like, I mean, I I asked for this, but this is not what I was thinking. Um, And and that's the thing is it's not always going to go, folks, how you think it should go. It's going to go how he decides it is to help you learn that lesson. And that's the biggest thing that a lot of people misunderstand whenever they're working with spirits is they don't realize that it's not always going to be the easy route. Sometimes slamming into that brick wall is exactly what you needed because how else do you find how to break? through it to climb over it or to go around it if you don't run into it you have to figure out these lessons because by doing so that is the lesson sometimes when you go around that brick wall or go through it you learn things you would never have learned if you didn't have that obstacle in your way Um, and that in itself is the hidden golden gem and he will give that to you but just brace yourself Um, So uh, we only have a few minutes left here before we wrap up. Like I said, the hour and a half always goes quick, and I would love to have you guys again down the road if you guys would be up for it. I think the fans are loving it as well. There's a ton of comments coming in right now, people just enjoying the show. But um, anything else that we should be watching out for, any other statements, and then I'm going to go ahead and let you guys tell us where we can check out your um, lessons and and ritual for hire and things that you guys do, but anything coming up other than the Gospel of the Ghouls 2 that we can count on, anything else you guys are working on right now? Uh, Apart from the Gospel of the Ghouls Volume 2, a bit later down the line, we will be releasing a book on the daemon, the personal daemon, and not exactly in the way that people think, (laughs) but we will be releasing one on that, and uh, yeah, we... It, this might sound weird, but a lot of our written works isn't really pre-planned. We're, we sort of wing it sometimes. Oh, the moment stuff. <laughs> well, the thing is, you can't plan. You can't plan high amounts of spiritual inspiration. I can say that for myself is you could try to sit down and write a book right now, but if it's not meant to happen right now, it's not going to, but there can be one night where it just floods in uncontrollably. And then you could go another six months of nothing. It it comes in when it's supposed to come into you. So I can completely understand what you said there that it isn't planned. It just kind of has to come as it's meant to come. Yeah. And uh, um, tip we can give everybody here now, it's like a heads up and works regarding necromancy. Now, um, as the planets are, as they, sit, as they stand now in the heavens, um, we name this the conjunction of Azrael. With that being said, that means that um, the realms of the dead will be superimposed upon re- the realm of the living. So all necromantic workings will be so much more uh, powerful. Um, this isn't exactly if yeah. you're a professional, <laughs> but it caught us by surprise. We did not expect that one yeah. day out of the blue, we were doing a working, 
all of a sudden it just blew up vastly more than usual. Uh, literally, on my neighborhood was going insane with activity, and then we're like, "Okay, what the fuck's going on here? What did we miss? We miss did we miss something?" Then we do what we usually do if we don't know what else to do, and we had a look at the planets. We also consulted with some, you know, psychopaths about it. And what you should look out for is. In particular, Jupiter and Saturn and retrograde in this particular fashion. Okay, very interesting. Two very powerful planets. As I said before, I I, am, I have not done a, a very extensive work with planetary magic, but I do know that um, Jupiter and Saturn are two very hidden keys that workings with them can launch things beyond. So that's interesting. You got, you've piqued my interest again, um, which seems to keep happening, but, um, no, that's interesting. And I, I like that. And I kind of resonate with that as well. Right. And, uh, suppose mentioning our services, we are a Ragnar Arcane services. That's our main business. And we also have, or we're also the owners, I suppose, of the Arcane Press, where we launched our books from as well. And also, and if we may use this moment to just send the word out there, if any of the listeners um, are aspiring occult authors, please, please contact us because we're looking for new material, practical. Oh, love it. Um, anyway, check out the Arcane Press as well. Our main site is Ragnar Arcane Services. We give apprenticeship courses. Our books are there. Our spell for hire services there. Yeah. And there is a lot of different services, folks. I mean, don't hesitate to go onto their site and look through it. A lot of different great workings. And you will find something if you're looking that will fit, you know, whether it's divination, whether it's just learning some of the very, you know, deep levels of knowledge and understanding of magic, whether it's, you know, needing an actual spell casting of sorts. Everything that you can imagine these two do. And they do it with proficiency, and it's on their site. So make sure you go on and check it out. Um, hire them if you are looking. If you're not planning on needing someone to hire, then I expect you guys to pick up their book, whether it's one book, whether it's you having a binge like me and you just buy everything at one time. You know, I don't think I've ever done that for anybody in the world. Um, do it. I, I promise you, if you take their work seriously and you perform it seriously, follow all the steps as they said, step by step, everything will change for you. And if that is not the point of your practice, then what the fuck are you doing this for? Is, is where, you know, where I come from. That's my standpoint. Exactly. Exactly. Agreed. Yeah. Shake your life up. You know, that, that's what it's about. I want you to shake your foundation, folks. Knock the rust off. Shake the loose debris off and come back cleansed. And I promise you that will happen. Um, so, you know, Baron and Baronessa, thank you so much for coming on to the show tonight and let me pick your brain. I'm sure I'll bug you from time to time with some messages because I got some new things I'm working on with your guys' workings that I am curious to see how it goes and would love to, you know, respond back to you of my experiences with it. And then obviously I and my listeners would love to have you back. We have several things coming in. This was fantastic. I really enjoyed this podcast this evening. I am looking forward to getting some of your books. Thank you, Baron and Baronessa. Um, Another one, great interview and great information. Thank you so much. Um, my my favorite interview on the show so far, and that's one of about a dozen other comments that are coming in right now, guys. So obviously people loved you tonight, and we certainly plan on bringing you back. Check out their website, and once again, to you two, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. You've been a brilliant host, and you're a very talented occultist as well. Well, thank we would, you. We absolutely love to be back on your show, and to all the listeners, thank you so much for your kind words. It's yeah, honestly, we're a bit speechless, actually. Yeah, you guys are awesome. We have three more that just came in. Great info tonight. Wonderful episode. Thank you. So thank you guys out there. Make sure you check us back in two weeks. We have Connor Kendall on the line. Um, and then two weeks after that, love him, hate him, doesn't matter. I'm going to have him on the show to speak his mind of recent events. Um, someone who's made a lot of shockwaves in one form or another. We have E.A. Coedding coming on the line to talk about his books and things. And as I said, there seems to be a very large divide in the occult right now of people that absolutely are die hard for him. Other people 
people don't like him at all, and that is no hate towards him. I'm just speaking what I see. I'm bringing him on and seeing what the guy has to say. So should be very interesting the next two episodes. After that, we have Enoch Petroselli, and then we have Alistair Knock coming on around October, around Halloween, I believe. It is our Halloween episode, I think. And uh, he is the leader of Magnum Opus, a satanic temple in Florida. He has written several great books on Satanism, one of the leading forces on specifically the subject matter of Satanism right now. Um, so it should be a great time. So stick around to the future episodes coming up. Make sure you listen to the past ones. Have any suggestions? Drop us a line at celestialoddities.com. Um, or excuse me, celestialoddities at gmail.com, rather. Um, or add us on Knights of the Nephilim podcast on Facebook, um, Freighter Crow on Facebook, and make sure you check out Aragni Arcane Services website and their Facebook. We love you guys. Thank you for listening tonight, and we will catch you next time. Have a good night. Thank you.